scandal strikes at the United States Military Academy at West Point. 90 cadets are accused of cheating during examinations and face dismissal charges. Involved is the historic honor code of the Academy. Its principles rest on the fact that a cadet will not lie, cheat, or steal, that any cadet is honor bound to report any infringement of these principles. Colonel Lear holds a press conference at the point concerning the scandal that has shocked the student body and stirred the nation and army officials. Charged with cribbing in class are many members of the football team, for years, one of the mightiest in the world. This continuation of football at West Point, Annapolis, is being advocated by some authorities. Speaking for Academy honor, Regimental Commander Geeches scores classmates for obtaining examination details from others who had previously taken tests. Although I have no personal knowledge of the details, there can be no leniency towards violators of the Cadet Honor Code. Whether it be one man or whether it be 90 men, no violator is ever granted immunity. Not since 1818 has the Code of Honor, established by Colonel Thayer, father of West Point, been so threatened. General Eisenhower, Commander-in-Chief of the Allied Powers in Europe, comes to Epenburg near The Hague to witness the transfer of American planes to Dutch Air Forces. With Dutch officials, General Ike sees the mighty Thunder Jets unveiled and dedicated to Western defense and peace. Commander and Air Force General Norstad talk with pilots who have been specially trained. American pilots, the Sky Blazers, demonstrate the terrific speed and power of the Thunder Jets. Mighty Thunder Jets that can strike like lightning. It's news when a rug creates an international furor, but that's what happens when the Giltners of Pueblo, Colorado, receive a rare leopard skin rug from Son Albert, a sergeant in Korea. He bought it as a souvenir and sent it home. Told his folks the 48 skin treasure came from a Korean palace and was worth only $25,000. The Giltners didn't keep it long. Korea wanted the rug back and Uncle Sam wanted to oblige an ally. So, exit leopard skin rug. Weekend gold seekers get their gear and strike out along the streams near Dalanega, Georgia. The name of the town is derived from the Indian word meaning yellow money. Since 1803, over $40 million worth of gold have been mined and panned in this vicinity. It is part of a gold belt extending from the Carolinas through Georgia into Alabama. Many weekend visitors figure there's more fun and profit in panning for the precious metal than in catching trout. R.D. Hogue weighs the catch. He's the host and the owner of thousands of acres of gold mines and lands. Evidently, his holdings pan out. Bobby Locke of South Africa tees off, followed by Kerry Middlecoff in the final round of the All-American Golf Tourney. Jim Ferrier gets away at Chicago's Tam O'Shanter Club where 10,000 fans follow the course of events. The hits and the misses. Misses? Watch this putt by Fred Hawkins. <laughs> Leading going into the final round, Kerry Middlecoff sinks a beauty to keep a firm grip on first place. All eyes are on the Memphis dentist who extracts plenty of oohs and ahs with his championship chip shot onto the 18th green. All Dr. Middlecoff has to do now is sinker and victory is his. He does and runner-up Hawkins congratulates the man who beat him by two strokes. The doctor says ah. The World Series of Motorboating, the Gold Cup race is held on Seattle's Lake Washington. First time west of the Mississippi. Eleven sleek racing craft have qualified for the thrilling marine event. And here they go on the third and final heat. Time takes a beating as the big boats knife through the water, their powerful engines kicking up spray. Looks like a hurricane, sounds like one. Fighting for 
for fourth place, Quicksilver with owner Orth Mathiot of Portland at the wheel, heads full speed into a turn and disaster. Before the horrified eyes of spectators, Quicksilver disappears beneath the surface, taking both Mathiot and his mechanic, Tommy Whitaker, to a watery grave. The race, won by slow motion fifth, is halted, and rescue boats begin the gruesome search for a shattered boat and its missing crew. Death comes as a violent climax to speedboating's big race of the year. Niagara Falls, long a challenge to the daring, is challenged again. In this cocoon of inner tubes lashed with canvas, Riverman Red Hill fulfills a deathbed pledge made to his father nine years ago. Here Red poses with his pet spaniel before beginning his dangerous stunt over the 165-foot cataract. Five others have gone over the brink before him. Two have lost their lives. A throng estimated at 200,000 watched tensely, expectantly, as Red Hill inside his inner tube barrel is towed out on the river and then cut loose. It's man versus the elements, and man loses. Red Hill's improvised rig is torn and battered by the long drop into the turbulent waters, and Red is not in it. His body was found on the rocks at the bottom of the falls. Grief-stricken, his brothers vow to carry on the family tradition, conquer the falls that claim still another victim. Tragedy leaves its mark on men, but the falls thunder on unperturbed. 